Well, hi there. Crocodilians are, I think, the coolest living reptiles. You know, since the only remaining dinosaurs are all birds and crocodilians are way cooler than birds. Though a few groups, like the ratites, might give them a run for their money. Crocodilians have existed for the last 95 million years, which means that they coexisted with the non-avian dinosaurs as well. T-Rexes were almost certainly eaten by crocodilians. Crocodilians such as Sarcosuchus, the largest crocodilian ever discovered. It may have been almost 10 meters, about 31 feet long, possibly even longer, and weighed about 4 tons. But there were many other rad ancient crocodilians and crocodilomorphs, such as the marine Dacosaurus, which had a tail fin and fed using suction feeding like a goblin shark, or Caprosuchus, which had the most terrifying teeth of any crocodilian ever. I mean, look at those. Or the herbivorous croc, Simosuchus. Suchus means crocodile, if you were wondering why it is coming up so often. Many of the ancient crocs were fully terrestrial, meaning they spent all of their time on land. This was a very diverse lineage that survived the extinction that wiped out all but one lineage of dinosaurs. We have a whole video about why they survived. But today, there are still well over 20 recognized species of these amazing creatures, nested within three extant families in the order Crocodilia. Those three families are the Alligatoridae, the Gavialidae, and the Crocodilidae. The Alligatoridae includes the alligators and the caimans, which are almost all found in the Americas. Almost. All of the caimans are in the Americas but not all of the alligators. There are two different species of alligators on Earth today. The American alligator, like gator tot here, which lives in the southeastern United States, growing to be about 15 feet long. That's about four and a half meters. And the Chinese alligator, which grows to be about five feet long, one and a half meters. It may seem strange that we would find the only two species of alligators on opposite sides of the map, but the phenomenon of finding similar species in southeastern North America and Southeast Asia is a common one. A huge number of plants, as well as cool animals like gigantic aquatic salamanders, paddlefish, and soft-shelled turtles, and many others, follow the same pattern. And this is likely due to the fact that Asia and North America might be on different sides of the map, but they're not so far apart on the globe. North America and Asia are actually neighbors. And in the past, a massive temperate deciduous forest stretched across both continents. The forest was inhabited by animals like paddlefish, giant salamanders, soft-shelled turtles, and, of course, alligators. As the climate changed, this forest shrank considerably. And today, the remaining parts of this forest are found in the eastern United States and Southeast Asia, along with the descendants of the organisms that once inhabited it, like alligators. This is called the Eastern Asian, Eastern North American Intercontinental Disjunction. And it impacts not only animals, but plants and other forms of life as well. The two extant alligator species form the subfamily Alligatorinae. They are distinguished from their closest relatives, the caimans, by the presence of a bony septum between the nostrils and the lack of the ventral armor possessed by the caimans. And I can show you this thanks to these amazing alligator skulls. The little one, which was super duper cool until about 30 minutes ago, was a gift from my good friend Dave Kaufman. And I actually waited to film this video until it got here because it's so cool. Of course, now it looks pretty dinky. The Caymans, subfamily Caymaninae, are comprised of three genera and six extant species. Two of my favorites are the two species of dwarf caimans. The Cuvier's dwarf caiman, like Ducky here, and the smooth-fronted caiman. These caimans are both small, armor-plated, and spend considerable time on land, which is reflected in their unwebbed hind feet. And they are all found in the northern part of South America. As we determined in our contest to decide which is the best pet reptile, crocodilians make the worst pet reptiles, at least as a group. But I do think that these two dwarf caimans are probably the least worst pets of all of the crocodilians. But only because they're small. And though we did find a few smooth-fronted caimans in the Amazon, I only recently learned from my friend Chandler how to differentiate between the two. The Cuvier's dwarf caiman is just a tiny bit shorter, maxing out at 1.73 meters, just over five and a half feet. Most are smaller than that. And they tend to weigh six or seven kilos, 13 to 15 pounds. They're about the same size as a tegu, 
whereas the largest smooth fronted Cayman was 2.6 meters, 8 feet 6 inches. So bigger, but still small. Most weigh between 9 and 20 kilos, 20 and 44 pounds. But other than size, the other difference, at least that I realized before today, is that these smooth fronted Cayman should be called the spiky as heck everywhere but the fronted Cayman. Their neck and back are covered with tall, sharp spikes. Both dwarf species are well armored, as these are the most vulnerable to predation of any South American crocodilians, but the spikes on the smooth fronted Cayman are next level. I just learned a second way to tell the difference from Joey at Scales and Tails, and this would be particularly valuable if you found, say, an older individual where those spikes have maybe worn down a little bit, and that is just by noticing the number of osteoderms between their hips. You see four of them on if you go across, four osteoderms on the Cuvier's dwarf caiman and only three on the spiky everywhere but the fronted caiman. The genus caiman includes the Yakari caiman, the spectacled caiman, and the broad snouted caiman, which is a rad caiman. These are basically your medium sized caimans, topping out between 8 and 10 feet, with females being considerably smaller still. This is generally true of crocodilians. The spectacled caiman used to be pretty common in the pet trade, despite being a really lousy pet. They're distinguishable by a bony ridge between the eyes that gives the appearance that they're wearing spectacles. And they do look more dignified than the giant cartoon glasses on the spectacled bears. Spectacled caiman are also found in northern South America, but also through Central America and into southern Mexico, as well as existing as invasives introduced into Florida and the United States. The Yakari caiman, the larger of the two, is found farther south in the center of South America. It can be distinguished from the spectacled caiman by where it is and the absence of the ridge between the eyes. The broad-snouted caiman is also found in Central South America, ranging all the way over to the East Coast. These guys do have a ridge between the eyes, like the spectacled caiman, but they're found in different areas and have very short, broad, rounded snouts. You're probably not going to confuse them with anything else. And last, but the opposite of least, is the genus Melanosuchus, which today is comprised of only the black caiman. These can grow to be somewhere between 16 and 20 feet long. That's over 6 meters. They are also found in the Amazonian regions of northern South America, where they are the largest of all predators. If you're in the Amazon and you're being eaten by a crocodilian, there's a fair bet that it's this one. However, outside of the Americas, and even in some places in the Americas, if you're being eaten by a crocodilian, the odds are that it is in the other clade of extant crocodilians, the Longirostris. This clade includes the remaining two extant crocodilian families, the Crocodilidae and the Gavialidae. And I'll start with the Gavialidae, because that is the one that makes me the most mad. If I would be to talk to you about a false water cobra, I would assume that you would think that I was either talking about a cobra that lives in false water, or a snake that looks like a water cobra, but isn't a water cobra. False killer whale, either a whale that was falsely accused of murder, or something that looks like a killer whale, but isn't one. False gharial, something that looks like a gharial, but isn't a gharial. Now, any of you that have seen our video on the ultimate reptile rumble know that there is a creature in and around India called a gharial. This is one of the longest of all crocodilians, with males coming in at as much as 6 meters, almost 20 feet, and weighing over 900 kilos, 2,000 pounds. Apparently, that is still small enough to not be disqualified from a battle that excludes both Komodo dragons and leatherback sea turtles, but it's still quite large. The name gharial comes from the nasal protuberance found on the noses of adult males that resembles an earthen pot called a gara. Though it's their jaws that are probably the biggest giveaway that the crocodilian in question is a gharial. Those long skinny jaws with zipper teeth are ideally adapted to catching fish, at least if suction feeding is not an option. So that is a gharial. But there is another very similar looking crocodilian from Malaysia, Borneo, Sumatra, and Java called the false gharial. Like the gharial, it has long, skinny, fish-catching jaws. They are also pretty comparably sized to the gharial. The longest skull of any extant crocodilian belonged to a false gharial. Despite all of these similarities to the gharial, the false gharial can be distinguished not only by location, but by the lack of the nasal protuberance, and the fact that the jaws broaden near the base more than those of the gharial. 
making them look a bit more like the Australian freshwater crocodile that we'll discuss shortly. And knowing that it is a false gharial, I always assumed that the false gharials were similar to gharials for the same reason that freshwater crocodiles are similar to them. They eat the same things. The false gharial is probably some sort of crocodile that looks a bit like a gharial due to convergence. But that is not the case. The family Gavialidae contains two extant species, the gharial and what I would call the other gharial. Because the closest living relative to the gharial is the false gharial, and the closest living relative to the false gharial is the gharial. It isn't a false gharial any more than the Asiatic black bear is a false black bear, or the alligator snapping turtle is a false snapping turtle, the American alligator, and the Chinese false alligator. It's a freaking gharial. It's just the other gharial, and I demand a rename. But now let's calm down for just a second and go to the last remaining family, which contains the crocodile and the 17 or so species of false crocodiles, the Crocodilidae. Generally speaking, if you are outside of the Americas and you are looking at a crocodilian without zipper teeth, it's probably a crocodile. If you're in Australia, uh, it's a crocodile even if it has zipper teeth. In the Americas, it can get a bit more complicated, as the ranges of alligatorids and crocodilids overlap considerably. But if you're in the Americas, in an area where both alligatorids and crocodilids exist, and you really want to know what you're looking at, a good first place to look is the fourth lower incisor. On an alligator or a caiman, this tooth will be essentially the same size as the other teeth. When the mouth is closed, it will slide into a socket on the top jaw and will not be visible. But the fourth incisors on most crocodiles are much, much larger than all of the surrounding teeth. And you can see this even when the jaws are shut. That tooth is so long that in many cases it would stick out of the top of the jaw if it went into a socket. And so it doesn't. The skull actually constricts in at the fourth incisor so that the tooth passes by on the outside instead of through the upper jaw. And the result is a very different head shape. Where alligators and caimans have broad, rounded snouts, the crocodile has narrower jaws that dip in just after the nostrils, again to accommodate that fourth lower incisor. The Crocodilidae contains two subfamilies, the Osteolemonae and the Crocodilinae. The Osteolemonae contains two clades, each of which has two species, though some analyses would suggest that some of these species may be further divided in the future. Right now, these clades include the two species of slender-snouted crocodiles and the two species of dwarf crocodiles, respectively. The two species of slender-snouted crocodiles, the West African and the Central African slender-snouted crocodiles, can be identified by their slender snouts. As is typical of animals with long, slender jaws of this sort, they are primarily fish eaters. Their jaws look a bit like those of the gharial and the other gharial, but th these are found in Africa and are smaller, though not tiny, with males reaching up to about four and a half meters, 15 feet, though most are somewhat smaller and weigh up to 667 kilos, 1,470 pounds. That said, most weigh less than half that much. If you're in Africa and you see a slender snouted crocodile, the best way to identify which one you're looking at is to look at the back of its head really closely, really closely. If it has a rounded tubercle on the squamosal scale, then it's a West African slender-snouted crocodile. If not, then it's a Central African slender-snouted crocodile. If you can't get that close, just know that the farther west you are, the more likely it is that it is a West African slender-snouted crocodile. And also remember that you don't know anybody that even knows that there are two species of slender-snouted crocodiles anyway. If you are in the same region of Central Africa and you see an even smaller crocodile that doesn't have a slender jaw, but rather a short, wide snout, it could be one of the two or so species of dwarf crocodiles. As their name would imply, these are the smallest of the crocodiles, growing no larger than about 1.9 meters, 6.2 feet. Most don't get over one and a half meters, five feet, and weigh between 18 and 32 kilos, 40 to 71 pounds. 
So they're little, larger than the Cuvier's Dwarf Cayman of South America, the smallest of all extant crocodilians, but the smallest of all living crocodiles. Like the Dwarf Cayman, they are heavily armored and spend considerable time on land and in smaller waterways where they are less likely to become the prey of other larger crocodilians. The Osborne's dwarf crocodile can be distinguished from its closest relative, the dwarf crocodile, by its darker coloration, broader, less upturned snout, and reduced body armor. Oh, and there's a population of dwarf crocodiles in Gabon that lives entirely in caves. They're also nearly blind, feed primarily on bats, and are orange. That just seems like something you should know. But that takes us to the final clade of crocodiles, the subfamily Crocodilinae which contains the largest and most dangerous crocodilians alive today. This is also the most diverse of all extant crocodilian lineages. The crocodilinae is divided into two large clades, but one single genus, Crocodilus. One of those clades contains the largest of all living crocodilians, and the other contains the second largest and the most frightening. And those aren't the same one. So let's start big and save scary for last. Like I said, the Crocodilus is divided up into two large clades, and this clade, which contains the largest extant crocodilian, itself is made up of two clades, each containing three or four species. The largest of them all, the saltwater crocodile, might be the most famous of them all, not only because of its immense size, reaching lengths of over 6.3 meters, 21 feet, and weighing north of 1,500 kilos, 3,300 pounds, but because their range is so expansive, going from Australia to India and everywhere in between. While the head is not as long as that of the gharial or the other gharial, the head and associated jaw muscles alone can weigh 200 kilos, 440 pounds. It's just a massive animal, the largest living reptile. And that will still be the case even if they bring back the elephant bird. And yes, I know that I just called birds reptiles. But the reality is that crocodilians are more closely related to birds than they are to any other group of reptiles. If birds aren't reptiles, then neither are crocodilians. And you'd probably need to take out the turtles as well. But back to the king of the reptiles. Saltwater crocodiles have big, burly heads. They are much broader than many of the fish specialists, but they are still quite long twice as long as they are wide at the base. Very different from the dwarf crocodiles that are roughly the same length as they are wide. But the most diagnostic feature of the saltwater crocodile is the lack of armor. Whereas the little dwarf caimans and dwarf crocodiles need extensive armor, the opposite is true of the king. The scoots on their backs are very reduced compared to the other crocodiles, and are even absent, especially at the back of the head and between the neck and the back. They also have a pair of bony ridges running from the eyes down the snout. Their closest relatives are the Siamese crocodile, and one of my all-time favorites, the mugger crocodile. Siamese crocodiles are found in the middle of the range of the saltwater crocodile, but are usually found more inland and they aren't found at all in Australia or India. They are smaller than their cousins, topping out at around 3 meters, 10 feet, and 120 kilos, 265 pounds, and they lack the ridges coming down the snout from the eyes. They are also much less inclined to be aggressive towards humans, so it can be important not to confuse a small saltwater crocodile for a Siamese crocodile if you're planning to try to pet it or something, though that probably would be ill-advised with either species. The closest relative to the Siamese crocodile is a crocodile I have loved since I discovered they existed in the sixth grade, the mugger crocodile, from in and around the Indian subcontinent. This means that you find them in the same areas as saltwater crocodiles, though generally more inland, and in the same area as gharials. Now, if you're confusing gharials and mugger crocodiles, you should probably back up and rewatch the part about gharials. But muggers do look quite a bit like their cousins, the saltwater crocodiles. They're smaller, usually just a bit bigger than Siamese crocodiles, so they have been observed to get as big as 5.6 meters, 18 and a half feet, and weigh 207 kilos, 456 pounds. Their snout is rougher in appearance than the Siamese crocodile, but lacks the ridges of the saltwater crocodile. And it is the broadest snout of any crocodile, in case you were still struggling to differentiate it from the gharial. But that broad snout comes in pretty handy because they like to balance sticks on their snouts. And they don't do it just for fun. It's a trap! You see, during the nesting season, many birds become very focused on finding sticks. And mugger crocodiles, being archosaurs, like to help their cousins out. 
Of course, trying to grab a stick off of the snout of a crocodile can be a bit risky. It's pretty cool to see a crocodilian using tools like this, though. On the other side of the clade, we find three more species, one of which is the only other crocodile found in Australia, the freshwater crocodile. Which would be a pretty silly name everywhere else, because most crocodiles are freshwater crocodiles. But in Australia, they only have saltwater crocodiles and crocodiles that don't really go into saltwater. So, freshwater crocodile works. Like we discussed earlier, freshwater crocodiles have long, skinny, fish-catching, gharial-like jaws. I would be just fine calling these false gharials. Of course, that common name is already taken by the other gharial. But once we get that fixed, it should be available for these little guys. And they are little, at least compared to the other Australian crocodile, rarely exceeding 3 meters or around 10 feet, and 100 kilos, which is about 220 pounds. Though they can get up to about 4 meters, 13 feet, so that's still tiny for a salty, but it's pretty big. Its closest relatives are the New Guinea crocodile, or crocodiles, and the Philippine crocodile, which are both places that I would like to go in the future to document as many species as possible for you guys. So if you would like to see that, please consider supporting us on Patreon. The Philippine crocodile is endemic to the Philippines, where, once again, the only other crocodile around is the saltwater crocodile. Now, unlike their close cousins, the freshwater crocodiles, the Philippine crocodile is relatively broad-snouted. It's smaller, about the same size as a freshwater crocodile, but again, with a broad snout more like that of a saltwater crocodile. It even seems to have the ridges coming down from the eyes like the saltwater crocodile. But the best way to tell them apart is to look at the armor on its back and neck. It doesn't have the big gaps in the osteoderms like you see with the saltwater crocodile. The Philippine crocodile was long considered a subspecies of its closest relative, the New Guinea crocodile, which now appears to be actually three distinct species, including the Philippine crocodile, the New Guinea crocodile, and the Hall's New Guinea crocodile. Given that there has been doubt about these being different species, it is unsurprising that the New Guinea crocodiles are very similar in size and shape to Philippine crocodiles. It can be differentiated from saltwater crocodiles, again by size and scoots, and from the Philippine crocodile, mostly by location. New Guinea is divided by a mountain range, and those to the north of this range are the New Guinea crocodiles, and those to the south are the Hall's New Guinea crocodiles. Other than by location, they can only really be distinguished by examination of skeletal features and subtle differences in the scalation. And that brings us to the last clade of extant crocodilians. The one that contains some of the largest and most terrifying of all crocodilians. Of the six remaining species, all but two live in the Americas, and are more closely related to one another than they are to the other two. The remaining two are from Africa, and have often been confused for one another, despite the fact that one of them, the Nile crocodile, is more closely related to the four American species than it is to its African neighbor and doppelganger, the West African crocodile, also known as the Desert Crocodile or Sacred Crocodile. Sacred because of the reverence that the ancient Egyptians had for them. They even mummified them. And they knew the difference between Sacred Crocodiles and Nile Crocodiles, which is important because Sacred Crocodiles are much mellower than their larger cousins. But we still seem to struggle to differentiate between the two, because when examined closely, almost every Nile crocodile in AZA zoos turned out to be a sacred crocodile instead. Oops. Now, sacred crocodiles are smaller than Nile crocodiles, coming in generally between 1.5 and 2.5 meters, 5 to 8 feet, and maxing out at around 4 meters, or 13 feet. But other than size, distinguishing them from Nile crocodiles requires a careful examination of their skull morphology. But if you're in Africa looking at a crocodile the size of a sacred crocodile, it's probably best not to try to ride it or anything like that, just in case you didn't get a good enough look at its skull. Heck, it's probably a bad idea even with a friendlier crocodile like the sacred crocodile. Probably just don't ride crocodiles. Nile crocodiles are not only grumpier, but they're larger too, coming in generally under 4.4 meters, about 14 and a half feet, and weighing under 1,000 pounds, about 450 kilos. Though they can grow to over 6 meters, 20 feet, and weigh more than twice that much, 1,089 kilos, that's 2,401 pounds. They are the second largest of all crocodilians, and I would argue more impressive looking than the saltwater crocodile. Mostly because they don't have the gaps in the osteoderms and have generally larger scoots. They're also beautiful, with a lot of yellows and striping. They're both pretty hardcore, but whenever I see a really impressive giant crocodilian, 
it always ends up being a Nile crocodile. But it isn't even the member of this clade that I find to be the most intimidating. The remaining four species are all more closely related to one another than they are to the Nile crocodile, despite being collectively more closely related to the Nile crocodile than the Nile crocodile is to the sacred crocodile. These final four from the Americas fall into two clades, each containing two species. And I'm going to start with the one that I have seen in the wild, and I'm going to save the scariest one, the one that almost ate a good friend of mine for last. A couple of years ago, I went road cruising in the Florida Everglades with my friends Chandler and Tyler. After seeing buckets of cottonmouths, which turned out to be shockingly pleasant, we arrived at a pond containing a pair of American crocodiles. The female let me get so close I could have reached out and touched her, but I was pretty sure that was a bad idea. This is, however, a very special animal that's found in Florida as well as Mexico, all the way down into Peru and Venezuela and all over the Caribbean. Like the saltwater crocodile, American crocodiles do very well in saltwater for extended periods of time and subsequently occupy a very large range. If you're in Florida and you see a crocodile, it's an American crocodile. But it isn't the only crocodile in many parts of its range, so it's worth knowing how to identify them specifically. American crocodiles, while smaller than Nile and saltwater crocodiles, are sizable, frequently growing to lengths of 3.85 meters, almost 13 feet, and weighing 50 to 250 kilos. It's 110 to 550 pounds. As with every croc species, at least as far as I know, males are considerably larger than females, and can get as large as 5 meters, 16 feet 5 inches, and may get larger still. They're really big. Unlike saltwater crocodiles, they have very large and continuous osteoderms on their backs. Their heads are robust, though proportionally longer and thinner than those of saltwater crocodiles or Nile crocs. They're sometimes mistaken for their closest relatives, the Orinoco crocodile of Colombia and Venezuela, but it isn't really all that hard to tell the two apart. Orinoco crocodiles are just as large, probably even larger. In the past, it appears that they were much, much larger. They tend to be found more inland than American crocodiles, and they have narrower snouts. The jaw does get broader as they age, and they begin to hunt more animals that are not fish. But until they get to be very large, I would be okay with calling them American false gharials. Now, it turns out that the American crocodiles and the Orinoco crocodiles seem to pose little threat to humans despite their size. Now, this crocodile, which is a Morlitz crocodile, comes to us from Scales and Tails, Utah. As did the dwarf caiman, the alligator, and most of the skulls that we've had here today. Scales and Tails does educational and highly entertaining hands-on reptile presentations here in Utah, and has been a really good friend to us here at Clint's Reptiles for many years, including our videos on Gila monsters and green anacondas, as well as our conversation with Lindsay Bull, who we will be meeting up with soon, very soon, to see how she and Darth Gator are doing now. Thanks in no small part to the generosity of you guys, it is my understanding that both of them are in a much better place now, but I suppose we'll find out more here in a few weeks. The Morlitz crocodile from eastern Mexico and parts of Central America, like its closest relative, the Cuban crocodile, can be distinguished from other American crocodiles, and most crocodiles for that matter, by its relatively flat osteoderms. Their scales look more like those of alligators to me than they do like most crocodiles, but they have a very proper crocodile head. Their jaws are wide for a crocodile as adults, but they still look like crocodiles, not alligators. They're also smaller than the other American crocodiles, though they can get up to 2.7 meters, which is almost 9 feet, and have been reported up to 4.5 meters, which is 15 feet, so they're not small. And they do occasionally kill and eat people, but it's their closest living relative, the pack-hunting semi-terrestrial Cuban crocodile, that I find to be the most intimidating of them all. Which is odd, because they aren't that big, generally under 2.3 meters, 7.5 feet, and weighing less than 80 kilos, around 180 pounds. Like the Morlitz crocodile, they have very alligator-like osteoderms. They really don't look like much. But the first time I went to see Chandler at the outpost, he taught me some things that changed my opinion of these crocodilians forever. And then that very crocodile almost bit his leg off. In areas where these overlap with the much larger American crocodile, the Cuban crocodiles are still the kings of the swamp as well as areas that are really not all that close to the swamp at all. And the first indication that this may be the case is not even their long, powerful legs for running and leaping on land, but their teeth. In the back of their mouth, Cuban crocodiles have broad crushing teeth for smashing turtles and other hard-shelled prey. But the teeth in the front do not look like crocodilian teeth. At least, not like any modern crocodilian teeth. They look like dinosaur teeth. Like the teeth of Allosaurus or Utahraptor. 
You see, most crocodilians today have cone-shaped teeth that are great for holding on when you drown your prey. But not that good for shearing through flesh. That's why they tend to bite and roll when they need to tear off pieces. In the distant past, however, there were many fully terrestrial crocodilian species. And much like long, skinny jaws have evolved multiple times to allow fish-eating crocodilians to better hunt fish prey, land-dwelling crocodilians consistently evolved blade-shaped shearing teeth in lieu of the cones of more aquatic species. Well, it turns out that the most terrestrial of all living crocodiles, and the largest highly terrestrial crocodilian alive today, is the Cuban crocodile. And you can see just how terrestrial it is by looking at its teeth. Backwards hooked little daggers. Lots of crocodilians are dangerous if you are in or near the water, or if you're trying to attack one. But what about one that might pop up out of the bushes, run you down, and then leap up and bite you on the face, shearing it off with, you know, its dinosaur teeth? And what if I told you that there is considerable evidence that they work together and hunt in packs? Now, Cuban crocodiles only exist in a very small region of Cuba. They rarely encounter humans. But pound for pound, and perhaps without any regard for total size, this might just be the most terrifying and awesome of all living crocodilians. But which one is your favorite? As always, like and subscribe, and we hope to see you real soon. Holy cow. For the record, my alligator skull was really cool until about 30 minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> Getting some uh, ghost pottery vibes right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see, I, I see what you're talking about. Do you mind singing? I can't sing. That's your job, man. <laughs> Maybe uh, sing it to sleep. Oh, my love. <laughs> <laughs> okay.